Well, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and welcome to day three of um, Canola Week. And today is called Innovation Day. And I just want to uh, uh, just send my appreciation out to you for participating in this conference. It's a really important conference that, uh, you know, for the industry. And uh, I certainly want to thank the sponsors. We were fortunate to be able to see their logos here a second ago, but I want to reiterate those because without the support of the sponsors, um, we would not be able to provide this in this forum. So uh, the gold sponsors are Alberta Canola, BASF, Bayer, Cargill, Manitoba Canola Growers Association, and SAS Canola. And our silver sponsors are the Canadian Canola Growers Association, uh, Global Institute for Food Security, GIFs, Western Grains uh, Research Foundation, so WGRF. And today, uh, what we want to do is take you into some uh, new innovations. Uh, each year we've been holding, for, since uh, about 2012, I think it started with Dr. Wilf Keller, um, had a day specifically for innovation. And this meeting has been going on for, for 50 years that uh, Dr. Keller has been, or Dr. Downey has been uh, organizing. And uh, about eight years ago, we, we, we peeled off a day that's specifically around innovation. So we could focus and have a, a greater emphasis, or, or, you know, a very specific focus on new innovations. And so uh, in our uh, sessions today, uh, we're gonna be talking about a few different things. And so I think it'll be very interesting to you. We're gonna talk about uh, how do we produce protein concentrates that have um, or what, what, what's the strategy towards producing protein concentrates that, that ha don't have the off flavors or sometimes associated or off, usually associated with, with uh, products from canola. Uh, we're gonna have uh, information on uh, what's happening in Malaysia. Uh, I, was, I had the good fortune of going over there just before COVID uh, restrictions and learned a lot about that market and how uh, this is an example of how our products go to Southeast Asia and help the, the health of people in that area. Uh, we're going to have some very interesting information on sort of the bio uh, production of, of lipids and uh, through the University of Alberta. And then we're going to uh, have a session on the breeding of Carinata for biofuel. So quite a broad range of sessions. And then we're going to have after that a second uh, one called Curtis's Corner. And you guys probably all know Curtis, but uh, talking about sort of venture capital investment in this area and talking about the production of sustainable polymers. I would like to highlight a couple of things. I would encourage you to ask questions. And so through the Q&A uh, sessions, you can ask questions as we're going through this. They won't be answered until the live session. So after the sessions are over, our speakers will come back and have live sessions to be able to answer those questions that show up in the Q&A. Um, also, I'd like to encourage you to take part in the networking sessions. So between the, the sessions and the day, um, when we have our longer breaks, you'll be able to go to that networking room go to a table we're gonna have speakers at those tables you'll have fellow uh, 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 people that you know in the industry there and so just take this opportunity to catch up with each other to ask questions and so I'd certainly encourage you to go to that networking lounge um, and certainly I think that uh, you're gonna have a, a, a very interesting morning and day so to start the off I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Hald, uh, Christoph Hald. And I had the good fortune of going to his presentation last year in Germany at an International Rapeseed Congress. And, and I was really fascinated by the work he did looking at what's causing these off flavors when we make protein concentrates. And so you can certainly find his bio. Um, he's a, a scientific research assistant at the Technical University of Munich, but just a fascinating piece of work. And so I'd like to turn it over uh, to Christoph. everyone. My today's talk will be about the identification of camphor glycosides, which is the key compound causing the bitter of taste in rapeseed protein. Now you may ask, why is this topic so important? First of all, a continuous growing population results in higher overall protein consumption when we compare the worldwide protein demand from 1960s with the predicted demand in 2013 we clearly see that the numbers have almost increased by factor four. But secondly, it's not only about the current population, it's also about our lifestyle choices and observable trends in the food market. For example, protein enriched sport nutrition or high protein yogurt products. Resulting from that, we can observe a steadily increasing daily protein intake per person 
So the question emerging is, how can we ensure the continuously growing protein supply for a growing population? If you think about the resources, resources we quickly find that they are limited. So plant-based proteins have a lot of advantages over animal-based proteins. To only name a few examples, proteins can be obtained out of pea, potato, linses, and chickpeas. Plant-based proteins, protein is sustainable, healthy, and can be produced out of side streams during the food production, which altogether leads to an increasing importance of plant-based proteins in the UN nutrition. But there are still challenges to get those proteins in the market. Firstly, the price of the proteins is high because of the cost of for de developing new processes. Secondly, the technological properties and the amino acid composition have to be optimized for the use in food. And thirdly, off color, off taste, or unpleasant aroma of the proteins can lead to consumer complaints, making it difficult to implement the protein products in the food market. Consequently, the question I worked on was to find out which compounds lead to the bitter off taste of rapeseed proteins. <clears throat> If we have a deeper look into the rapeseed, we can see that it contains up to 30% of oil, which was the main reason for its breeding in the past. Besides the oil, rapeseed contains a lot of protein, which up to now is mostly used for feed. But because of its good balanced amino acid composition, it could be as well be suitable for human nutrition. Additionally, rapeseed contains many secondary plant metabolites, which can com complicate the usage of the protein for generating of color or of taste. To now investigate the compounds leading to the bitter off taste of rapeseed proteins, we applied this as sensomics approach, which facilitates the identification of taste active compounds for the rapeseed protein. We started with a taste profile analysis followed by sensory guided fractionation to locate the bitter compounds. As the original sample was stepwise dissembled, after receiving purified compounds, the structure will be determined by mass spectrometry, as well as 1D and 2D NMR spectroscopy. After the structures are identified and LCM is an LCMS method for their quantification will be set up. With the quantitative data, a model system in accordance to the initial sample can be, can be assembled. Reviewing the contribution of the identified bitter substances to the overall flavor profile. The knowledge received from the sensomics approach can further be used in receptor studies, improving technological properties, Directing breeding strategies. <clears throat> At the beginning, I had two different rapeseed proteins, where one was napping rich and one cruciferin rich. These two proteins are the two main storage proteins in rapeseed. The samples were put to human sensory anal analysis and taste profile was generated. As you can see here on the left for the cruciferin rich, and on the right side for the napping rich protein, the cruciferin rich protein showed a strong bitter astringent and sour taste, while the napping rich protein exhibited a more complex taste profile, showing next to a strong astringency an additional sweet licorice and salty taste. Since we were interested in the bitter tasting compounds, we started the sensory guided fractionation with the cruciferin rich, rich protein by extracting the protein with solvents of different polarities from the methanol water mixture up to pentane. At that, the polar methanol water fraction was perceived as the most bitter fraction by the sensory panel and was consequently used for stepwise solid phase extraction 
and with this a further fractionation. The resulting fractions were presented to the sensory panel again, and the highest bitter taste was observed for the fraction eluted with 50% methanol. <clears throat> for further fractionation of this fraction, a HPLC system was used to separate the mixture of substances. On the left side, you can see the HPLC chromatogram, and on the right side, you can see the corresponding taste dilution factor obtained for each fraction. The TD factor was received by presenting the fraction in stepwise decreasing concentrations to the sensory panel. The lowest against the water blank perceivable concentration represents the TD factor. Especially fraction 1C8 revealed a very high TD factor, showing at first a bitter and then a stringent of taste, indicating the importance of the contained substances to the overall bitter taste. <clears throat> to determine the structure of the comprised compounds in this fraction, we obtained LCTOF MS and MSMS data. Much to our surprise, only one substance could be detected in this fraction with a specific fragmentation pattern. In the MSMS -MS spectrum, which you can see here, we could observe a max loss of 224 Dalton indicating synapinic acid, followed by a characteristic loss of two sh sugar moieties by the leftover Eclicon with an observed mass to charge ratio of 284 could be identified as camphorol. To clarify the order in the connection of the molecules, one and two D NMR spectra were measured. Exemplary shown here in the HMBC spectrum, where you can see the coupling of the characteristic sugar protons with either the carbon atom of synapinic acid, which is given in red, or the carbon atom of the camphoric eclicon, which is drawn in green. <clears throat> Via the blue market coupling, the connection of the two sugar moieties can be included, thus giving us the complete structure. Like that, we were able to cl clearly identify Camphorol-3O2O sulfuroside, which exhibit in human sensory studies a very low human taste pressure of only 3.37 micromole per liter. To subsequently determine the, the dose over threshold factor, we built up a quantitation method. After extracting the sample with methanol water equilibration, in filtration, the sample was injected into the LCMS system. Considering the quantified amount of the chemical glycoside in the empirically gained human taste threshold, could the frame rich sample exhibit the highest concentration of in the bitter substances and correspondingly also the highest dot factor and bitter taste? In contrast to that, Rapsidmir and the napkin rich protein samples showed lower dot factors and do slower bitterness. <clears throat> to prove the high impact of this compound to the overall bitter off taste of the good suffering rich sample, which spiked the same amount of camphoric glycoside, it was quantified in the initial sample to the taste less milk protein casein and presented the sample to the sensory panel. In white, you can see the bitter intensity obtained for the pure casein. In the blue strippy middle section, you can see the perceived bitter value of the initial luciferine rich sample. And on the right side, the results from the camphorol spike casein sample are shown. From these results, we can see that the prepared sample showed no difference in the luciferine rich protein when considering the bitter taste perception. This confirms the high impact of the identified camphoric glycosides to the, to the overall bitter taste of rapeseed proteins. 
With this study, we were able to identify the camphorous VO2 osinopyrosulfurosite as a key of taste in rapeseed proteins. This knowledge now allows a targeted, oriented improvement of technological processes and breeding programs. I would like to thank all of my project partners for the great work and you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And I think that's going to give us a lot of insight into the flavor profile and that was a unique piece of, of work. Um, I also was remiss, I did not introduce myself. My name is Rex Newkirk. I'm a professor, associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agricultural Research Chair in Feed Processing Technology. So <laughs> I apologize, I should have done that. And next up we have uh, Dato uh, Neo. And so uh, Dato, is a, Dato Neo is a uh, 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 managing director for Soon Soon Group in Malaysia. I've known um, him for a while because during my PhD work on canola processing, uh, he was actively engaged in that and very encouraging and used uh, a fair bit of that technology. And, and he really showed that he's interested in uh, this industry and creating a, a superior product and uh, the best product possible. I also found out uh, a lot about his company when I had the chance to go to Malaysia in March and do seminars for the Canadian industry, uh, for the canola industry, and also with his company, we did some uh, <clears throat> uh, as a second day seminars. And I, I, I really grew an appreciation for what they're trying to do to improve the health and wellness of their people uh, through bringing in uh, fatty acid profiles that they require. And I thought this is remarkable in a country that has done so well with palm oil, uh, but but he's recognizing that with canola into their market, I won't take away his thing, but I just was really fascinated by the work he's doing there and just really encouraged by it. And I thought this is an opportunity for us to understand what some of the movers and shakers could be in Southeast Asia. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Neil. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from Penang, Malaysia, where the temperature is currently at 83 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you for inviting me to the Canola Innovation Day. I want to share with you the efforts we have made to promote canola oil and canola, canola meal in the Malaysian and Southeast Asian food and feed markets. We started this journey a couple of years ago and the Canadian High Commission helped by bringing in Professor Newker to give seminars on the use of canola oil and meal in food and animal feeds. Here you can see the Trade Commissioner, Mr. Thomas Evos on the left, Professor Rex Newker in the centre and I'm on the right. Now, I will tell you about our efforts to promote a palm oil and canola oil blend. First, we'll look at the overall situation regarding canola oil in the Southeast Asian markets. Then we will articulate the reason why we blend palm oil with canola oil. Next, we will show you examples of our product marketing, product distribution, display and highlights. And then we'll tell you about our challenges and we will make some recommendations. And finally, we'll give you our conclusions. Canola oil constitutes about 13.8% of the world's oil consumption. Last year, amounting to about 200 million metric tons. Southeast Asia has a very large population of 664 million people. However, canola oil only constitutes 0.4% of a total of 30 
million tons usage. Why is this so? Mainly because palm oil is available as a cheap and stable cooking oil, widely used in Malaysia and most Southeast Asian countries. However, it's virtually deprived of any omega-3 fatty acids, which are important for general health, brain and eye development. On the other hand, canola oil contains 10% of omega-3 fatty acids, but which is not very stable and therefore not very suitable for deep frying. Moreover, there is about a US dollar 300 per metric ton premium for canola oil over palm oil, which is hindering wider usage. After much research, we recommend a blend of 60% palm oil and 40% canola oil in order to harvest the benefits of both oil, as well as making the blend more affordable. Blending palm oil with canola oil improves the health status of the blend while making it more versatile for cooking. The blended oil remains clear at 15 degrees C or 59 degrees F due to the synergistic eutectic effect, making it suitable for tropical as well as subtropical countries like uh, southern China, southern Europe and northern Australia. The blend contains 3% of omega-3 and more than 50% of omega-9 with a favorable ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 of 4 to 1. Therefore, one tablespoon will provide about half the daily requirements of omega-3 for adults and children. This chart shows the synergistic eutectic effect of palm oil in canola oil blends. And you can see that a blend of 60% palm oil in and 40% canola oil will produce a liquid oil at 15 degrees Celsius and a near liquid oil at 10 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the key features of this blend is the omega-3 content is more than 3%, the omega-9 content is more than 50% with a favorable ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 or 4 to 1. It is suitable for all types of cooking. It has a high smoke point of 235 degrees Celsius or 455 degrees Fahrenheit and the oil remains clear at 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, this is the label of our product, Canolin, which is a blend of palm oil and cold press refined canola oil. This is the bottle itself. These are examples of our marketing materials. On the left, you have a streamer and on the right, you have the product flyer. Basically, they are in three languages, which reflects the multilingual aspect of our country. And here you can see our products on the retail shelf uh, at trade shows, uh, in e-commerce, online marketplaces, and generally they are available from the major uh, supermarkets in Malaysia. So what were our challenges and our recommendations? In general, consumers lack knowledge on how to select the right cooking oil and have low awareness on the benefits of a healthy cooking oil. The majority of consumers still prefer a lower price cooking oil. When we introduced canolin in May 2020, because of the pandemic, we could not do any on the ground activity to promote the product and therefore it was very difficult to communicate the message across to the consumer on why they should consider canolin as an alternative to palm oil. Therefore, we will require the Malaysian government to subsidize healthier cooking oils such as 
the palm olein canola oil blends instead of just subsidizing palm olein at this moment. We also need the government to support us on promotional funding, mass media, social media marketing, key account listing preferences to drive awareness. Driving awareness and sending the message of better health and nutrition of the canola palm olive brand is absolutely essential to its success. Well, this is a summary of our canola marketing campaign and promotions. The basic main theme is best of both worlds. This is where Malaysia and Canada are working together in a partnership by synergizing canola oil and palm oil for affordable health and versatility. This is the main theme for our product. In terms of positioning, we are improving, hoping to improve cardiovascular health and it's important for brain and eye development the products high in omega-3, high in omega-9, has a favorable ratio of omega-6 with omega-3, is good for frying, has high stability, and we are targeting mainly urban consumers, and our pricing is Canadian $2.80 per kilo. We will distribute it through the local supermarkets, the international uh, supermarkets, convenience stores, mini-marts, and in the online marketplaces such as Lazada and Shopee. In terms of promotion, we need to do Facebook, Instagram, write-ups and postings, radio ads, e-newspaper ads, in-store promotions, and we will require a marketing fund support to carry out all these activities. In conclusion, a statistic blend of 60% of palm olein and 40% of canola oil combines the advantages of both palm olein and canola oil, making the product more affordable, healthy, and versatile for cooking. Blending palm olein and canola oil improves the cold stability of palm olein and the frying stability of canola oil. We do not claim any intellectual property rights. And therefore, any company from Malaysia or anywhere in the world can market this plan under their own label, but with a common agreed team. Now, we will tell you about our success story of introducing the use of canola meal in poultry and pig feed in Malaysia, as well as Southeast Asia. First, we'll look into the rationale of using canola meal in animal feed. Then we'll tell you about the feeding trials we did with canola meal and we'll give you the conclusions. Well, the world is too dependent on soybean meal as a protein source. 70% of all protein meals are soybean meal. Southeast Asia is even worse. We are about 80% dependent on soybean meal. Over dependency on soybean meal in animal feed makes the feed vulnerable to quality fluctuations. Very few alternative sources of good quality protein meals are available today. Therefore, if you blend soybean meal with about one third of a good quality canola meal, it will give a better amino acid ratio for use in animal feeds, thus avoiding excessive amino acid catabolization which is not good for the animal. Using canola meal in animal feeds will minimize the impact of entry nutritional factors from soybean meal. Canola meal with a higher oil content has intrinsic oil, which is easily digested and absorbed by the animals, resulting in higher metabolizable energy. And using canola meal will allow the reduction or withdrawal of animal proteins or fats, thus minimizing the risk of introducing pathogens. That is a very important uh, aspect of the animal feed industry today, where we are trying to reduce uh, pathogens in the feed. This is a table that shows in the second column the 
requirements, amino acid requirements of broiler chicken grower. In the third column, you have the digestible amino acid ratios from the house of meal. If you compare column 2 and column 3, you will see that soybean meal is deficient in methionine, cysteine, threonine, and excessive in arginine. But if you look at column 5 for canola meal, you'll find that canola meal is excessive in methionine, cysteine, tryptophan, and threonine, and arginine is in deficiency. So by blending canola meal with soybean meal, you actually have a better product which is closer to the amino acid requirements for broiler chickens. So here is the specifications for our product. It's a high fat canola meal with 12% oil and has a very high metabolizable energy of 2650 kcal per kilo compared with 2000 for normal canola meal. The main difference between our canola meal and the solvent extracted canola meal is in the protein solubility in potassium hydroxide, which is an indicator of protein digestibility. So the average KOHPS of our canola meal is about 86.5 compared with 52.5 for solvent extracted canola meal. Expeller canola meal is in a similar region of around 50 to 60, while the cold pressed canola meal can be as high as ours, but of course, because no heat was involved in the processing, uh, you may run into problems with uh, anti nutritional factors which are not deactivated by heat. We carry out broiler chicken feeding trials using this high fat canola meal to partially replace soybean meal. Here are the results of the starter period from 0 to 16, 16 days. As you can see, the lowest feed conversion ratio was achieved when the diet contained 15% of high fat canola meal. This result is statistically significant and it also allows the feed cost to be reduced by US dollars $16.50 per metric ton. The weight gains were not significantly different. Overall, there was no significant difference between the performance of the canola meal diets compared with the soybean meal control. In terms of feed conversion ratio or weight gain. However, the canola meal diets gave slightly lower weight gain and FCR, but not significantly so. And the reason for this is probably because when we ran this trial, we used 2,700 kilocal per kilo as the metabolizable energy for our canola meal. Today, we have reduced that to 2,650 and it is performing very well in both chicken and pig feed. In conclusion, this trial shows that there is no significant difference in broiler performances when d house soybean meal is partially replaced with high fat canola meal up to 15% in the diet, despite an increase of 40% in fiber of the feed. There is no palatability issues with high fat canola meal. Feed intake was not significantly different for all the treatments. The best free conversion ratio of 1.143, which was statistically significant, was obtained when 15% high fat canola meal was used in the starter diets, which can save up to US dollar 1650 per metric ton in starter feed costs. Thank you very much for having me today. I'll be available for questions. Three, two,
Why? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Neo. And uh, it's interesting times right now. Um, certainly, I think the opportunity to get some omega-3s into Southeast Asian diets um, and, and complementing the, the cooking properties of the palm is a very important one. And uh, right now, our prices for meals, protein meals, soybean meal especially, is at an all-time high. And so certainly options for that market are, are important. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Chen, who is a uh, associate professor at the University of Alberta, and he's looking at lipid biotechnology. And uh, in his presentation, he's going to talk to us about a very unique conjugated linolenic acid and, and production and sort of looking at the uh, canola as a factory for uh, unique uh, products. So I'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone, I hope all is well with you. Thank you for the opportunity today. I would like to talk, would like to talk about our uh, project. The title is Development of Canola for Ponisic Acid Production. In this presentation, I will first talk about natural source and beneficial bioactivities of ponisic acid. Then I will talk about development of canola for ponytic acid production. And finally, I will give a conclusion and talk about future perspectives. Ponytic acid is showing the structure here. It contains 18 carbon, three double bonds, and those three double bonds are conjugated C's, trans, and C's. Pomegranate seed oil is a major natural source of ponytic acid. If you get this pomegranate seed and extract oil, test that with the gas chromatography, we can say it contains 65% of ponytic acid or even higher based on different species, but generally more, uh, more than 75% of uh, ponytic acid as a total fat acid. Ponytic acid, because of this special structure, it has a unique uh, chemical and physical properties. It has been used in cosmetics, neutral nutraceuticals, and functional foods. Also, pomegranate seed oil is expensive. Indeed, we uh, bought some pomegranate seed oil from a supplier from the United States last year. We used that uh, in, a, uh, in a project. And the drum price of this pomegranate seed oil is about $25, you know, Canadian dollars per kilogram. Ponytic acid, based on the animal trials on their studies, it has different kinds of bioactivities. For example, it has been proven to have this uh, uh, can preventive uh, uh, functions, anti-inflammatory, uh, high polypidemic, anti-diabetes, or anti-obesity uh, activities, or anti-oxidant activities as well. Uh, I took this uh, photo from our review published in 2018 in applied microbiology and biotechnology. Please feel free to check, check that if you're interested in it. I would like to also use two examples to, to two examples to explain uh, ponytic acid's potential uh, values. This is unpublished data from Dr. Catherine Fields' lab. In this experiment, they uh, grow uh, raised cancer cells uh, in vitro and add pomegranate seed oil based on to test their inhibition efficiency to the growth of breast uh, of uh, breast uh, um, breast cancer. The results are quite interesting because as low as 15 micromole of ponytic acid can effectively inhibit the growth of those cells with a p-value of zero point less than zero point zero point one. Another example, this is an ongoing project. It's a collaboration between my lab and Dr. Ko run Dr. Dr. Ko's lab in our department at the University of Alberta. What they did is that they test uh, different concentration of ponytic acid or pomegranate seed oil to see if that can promote uh, uh, broader health. Because 
uh, antibiotics uh, was used to uh, promote the growth uh, of uh, chicken in years, but uh, it has been uh, in, uh, prevented. It's not allowed anymore. So in these experiments, they, were, they test a different concentration feed of polynesic acid in diet. They found that as, as low as 0.1% of polynesic acid can effectively um, improve for our chicken if we, let's see the data here, it's actually comparable to antibiotic at the positive control and way better than the negative control. So with those potential and confirmed uh, values of polynesic acid, we we'll say, yeah, it is special fatty acid with potential values. So our uh, question is, can we produce it in canola? Why would we do that? We think there are a few reasons for us to do that. First, the pom pom pomegranate uh, oil enriched in polynesic acid has pro uh, proven benefits already. That's a good thing. And also, canola is the uh, uh, or number one oil crop in Canada and the number three in the world. It's really important. And also, canola oil is already established as healthy. Well, pom pomegranate, we mainly grow them as a fruit. So the production is not reliable and big. So if we really want to use the pronistic acid enriched oil in a relatively large scale and uh, for different kind of applications, so we really need a more reliable, consistent, and cheaper supply of this kind of oil. Another thing is uh, pom um, pomegranate seed oil is uh, expensive. So we say if there's a small market, even a small market of pronistic acid, it would benefit the kind of uh, producers for example, contract-based uh, growth of this special canola, uh, that may benefit canola producers as well. To produce uh, polynesic acid in canola, first we would like to compare uh, fat acid compositions in pomegranate, pomegranate seeds and canola seeds. So as shown in the picture at the uh, left side, pomegranate seed contains high amount of polynesic acid, but a very low amount of other fat acids. Well, in canola oil, it's containing kind of high amount of 18-1 oleic acid, but a very low amount of 18-283, almost no, uh, and it has it's no conjugated fat acids. So if you want to produce it, we need to get genes from pomegranate seed and transfer that to canola to do that. Is that complex? No, it's not. Actually, if you look at the pathway, from oleic acid, H1, to polynesic acid, we only need two genes. One is a fatty acid desaturase 2, it covered H1 to H2. Another is a conjugase, or we in brief we call it beta X, it covered H2 to H3. So to do that, Dr. Ayla, who was a research associate in uh, Dr. Reddy Wesley's lab, she, put, she got those two genes from pom pomegranate seeds, put them under seed-specific promoter napin, that's a promoter from canola, and then transform that into agrobacteria. So it's ready to transform canola. And the transformation of canola was carried out in Dr. Sally Shaw's lab at Albert and Louis. They, uh, they use the GC culture to do that and use the kind of as a selection marker. Well, they get those lines, host those two genes, and how it sees, and then we check the oil content. Especially we put a focus on polynesic acid. We can see in the white type canola, of course, it can see zero amount, zero percentage of polynesic acid, but all the other lines, as long as they host this uh, constructs or host these two genes, F82 and F82, X from pomegranate seeds, they can produce polynesic acid. Although all the polynesic acid contain a uh, larger variable into different lines, but if we see those uh, mean value as indicated by the horizontal ball, some lines can accumulate like nine percent, uh, and then six to nine percent of polynesic acid there. So we choose those lines with the uh, 
grow the polycyclic acid content, grow them to the next generation. Of course, their segregation, and we got non-segregants as nice negative control there. And uh, we also use white type breast snipers as control as well. We can see all those lines still can accumulate relatively a uh, good amount of uh, polycyclic acid here. And uh, even one line, so even like uh, about 10% of polycyclic acid. Also, we check the total oil, seed oil content. We can see all those lines can produce polycyclic acid. Their total seed oil content is still comparable to those control and the white top brass snipers. If we do statistic analysis, there's no significant difference. We did it, we moved it further. We want to see if uh, the polycyclic acid uh, stable in lines or generations. So we choose the best canola line and grow them to another generation. We got those seeds, check oil, polycyclic acid content here as showing the, those results. We can see in those T2 seeds, it contains uh, uh, orange like 10% uh, polycyclic acid, the range from six to 11. And in T3 C's, uh, the polic content, polic acid content is relatively similar. So we would say they are somehow stable over two generations. Also, we didn't observe any negative effects on seed germination. That's a good thing as well. We also checked polic acid distribution in labeled fractions. We found like a lot of them in triacyclacerol, also quite some in polar lipids and acyclacerol. Is somehow similar. However, because seed of seed oil is mainly contains triacyclacerol, so we would say most of the polycyclic acid actually is in triacyclacerol in the seed oil. From, uh, from there, in conclusion, we, uh, we found that co expression of two genes, fat 2 and fat S from pomegranate. pomegranate is an effective strategy to uh, produce polycyclic acid in canola. Also, we got those canola lines, and they, they can accumulate up to 11% of polycyclic acid. And the levels of polycyclic acid in seed oil, canola seed oil, are relatively stable over two generations, and they don't have negative effects on seed germination. In the future, if that's a chance, I would like to continue this project in my lab. And first thing we want to do, we would like to do a field trial. Field trial for two, two purposes. First, we want to see their performance in the field, of course. And also, we want to produce enough seed oil for further characterization. Because we really want to see their potential values as much as possible. For example, we can check their uh, nutraceutical uh, values, like anti-cancer. We can check if they can be used in functional food or in feed as alternative to uh, health promoting antibiotics, for example. Actually, when we published this paper in August in metabolic engineering, the next day I got an email from a food company and they want to know if they can test those oil in their food products. I just told them, sorry, I don't have the oil yet because we. We didn't do a field trial yet, but if we have an oil, we would love to let them to test it. We actually, my lab and that company, we actually signed a non-disclosure agreement for, for the discussion and for future collaboration on this. Of course, if there's chance, I would like to see if we can further increase polycyclic acid content in canola by expression of other genes in that. We have some preliminary data there in our autopsies. We think some genes are really promising. So if there's chance, I would like to test that in lab because we have those technology or the facility available in the lab already. As I mentioned at the beginning, this project is not a project from my lab. Actually, the project was started in Dr. Randy Westlake's lab in 2012 also, eight years ago. At that time, I was a research associate uh, in his lab. Mainly, Ella was a research associate at that time, really work on this project, and Dr. Sally Shah's lab contributed to that uh, as well. 
When I moved back from University of uh, Manitoba to University of Alberta in 2017, I just continued this project because I really think it's an interesting one. And Dr. Yang Xu was a former postdoc in my lab, and he, she, sorry, she worked on this project and used some of the, some of the data and write up manuscript published in this year. For this project also, uh, for my lab and uh, Randy's lab, we got uh, really good support from uh, Alberta Canola Producer Commission. We really appreciate that. We also get a good support, really good support from Alberta Innovis and Zerk, and uh, both of us get uh, the support from our Canola Research, Canada Research Chairs Program and the facilities so was purchased with the funding from Canola Foundation for Innovation and the Alberta province, province like Alberta Innovis as well. So I would like to uh, stop here. Thank you for your time and listening to this. And I would like to take any of the questions you may have. Thank you. And I also look forward to your suggestions. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much and uh, very interesting stuff. Just to remind you, we do have a question and answer period after this next uh, speaker. So please do keep putting in your questions. I appreciate the questions coming in and uh, the, the speakers will be able to come on live and, and answer those questions that you put into that panel. Next up, we have Dr. Rick Bennett from uh, New Seed to talk to us about uh, breeding Carinata for biofuels. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. I'd like to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to speak uh, at this year's meeting. My name is Rick Bennett, and I'm the um, breeding lead for the Carinata program at New Seed. And um, I've been asked to speak about uh, both the Carinata breeding program itself, as well as uh, a little bit about the Carinata platform. And so I hope you find this presentation of, of interest. Uh, I believe many of you have been uh, or are familiar in varying degrees with the Carinata program, uh, either Carinata as a species or uh, the platform itself. And I know a number of you have been directly involved uh, in various aspects of, uh, of the development. Um, being a brassica crop, we've benefited greatly from um, uh, collaborations within the brassica community, so technologies that have been developed for canola or condiment mustards, uh, as well as uh, collaborative efforts in these circles uh, has been very beneficial for the program. <clears throat> so just to set the stage uh, and talk about uh, the biofuels industry, it is a rapidly evolving and uh, very fast growing industry at the moment. Um, and just to give an example of that, I've put a graph on the left um, looking at uh, infrastructure for the capability to produce renewable diesel just in the US. So these are through hydro treated uh, or HBO processes. Um, and under construction is the capacity to add about 6 million metric tons um, more capacity per year. And so that's just one example among many of uh, of the growth of the industry. Um, there's several reasons for this. Uh, some are government mandates or incent incentive programs, and others are uh, internal industry um, goals or mandates uh, as well. And so a lot of um, a lot of investment is going into this area currently. Um, and that demands a need for um, various feedstock sources. And uh, as a um, company and a platform, we see great opportunity for growth uh, going into the future here. Um, I also, as a side note uh, in these circles, thought I would include some numbers on rapeseed oil and um, its use as a feedstock worldwide and also in the European U Union. And so obviously it's a significant 
player currently. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what opportunities arise as, as policies evolve. We have developed Carinata as a high value biofuel feedstock platform. And I've listed a few of the factors that play into that here on this slide. I'll just touch on a couple of them. One is that it's positioned as a high value cover crop. So currently it's primarily grown as a winter crop in between summer cash crops or food crops, such as soybean, um, which is common in South America. Um, as such, it is a non-indirect land use change um, platform, meaning that if a grower decides to grow Carinata, it's not um, causing non-agricultural land to be converted. Uh, it's not causing forests to be chopped down in order to, to grow this feedstock. Uh, it's a system that optimizes <clears throat> greenhouse gas reduction. And a couple of uh, factors that are uh, important in this include the use of minimum or no-till systems, as well as uh, incentivizing the use of organic nitrogen fertilizer inputs such as manure, uh, as well as capping synthetic nitrogen sources, both quantity and, and type, uh, in the system that, that helps optimize greenhouse gas savings. And we also um, uh, have developed it as a non-GM crop as uh, right now a lot of the grain is imported into the European Union, specifically France. And so that's an important uh, component of, of uh, this platform. Carinata is certified sustainable by the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials. And um, each farm is fully audited. Uh, currently, we use SCS Global uh, for that process. And um, RSB is a uh, multi stakeholder organization that is internationally recognized and assures that uh, Carinata is being grown with uh, sustainable principles. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that uh, adds uh, validity to the greenhouse gas numbers that are being generated and uh, to the value of the grain and resulting oil. Um, currently, our commercial program is growing the most rapidly in South America, particularly in Uruguay and Argentina. In Uruguay, uh, the program has been going for five years now. Um, and so I've included pictures from both, uh, both countries. Um, our variety right now is named Avanza 641. And so that's adapted to winter environments and is a high oil content uh, variety. But we are rapidly moving into hybrids and um, expect our first hybrid uh, commercial launch to occur in 2022. Uh, the program's benefited from many collaborate, uh, collaborations and um, uh, joint efforts over the years. Uh, I've listed three of the major grants we've been involved in, but this list by no means is all inclusive. Um, growing forward to and now the uh, diverse field crop cluster, uh, we've worked very closely with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, as well as Muster 21 on various projects uh, in these uh, grants. And we also have a large USDA NIFA grant right now uh, in the Southeast US uh, dubbed SPARC. Uh, and that involves 10 public institutions, including USDA, as well as um, four private industry partners. And so a lot of agronomy, um, germplasm screening, um, life cycle analysis, rotation studies, uh, as well as some of the work on the back end logistics are all being conducted under the SPARC grant. And so tremendously helpful for the program. Um, and I'll speak a little bit, maybe a little bit more to uh, the collaboration we've had with Agriculture Canada and Muster 21 uh, in this presentation. Now, one of the projects that we have been working on, and this is somewhat parallel to the, the 
NAM project that Sally Vale is, is heading up for Canola. Um, but the Nested Association Mapping Project in Carinata aims to um, make available molecular tools that will benefit the breeding program. And so we've run uh, two full populations uh, of phenotyping in Saskatoon. And this program, I should mention, is um, largely headed up by Dr. Isabel Parkins' group. Um, and then we've also utilized our connection with the University of Florida. Um, to run a full phenotyping set there in a winter environment. Um, these phenotyping efforts have been an amalgamation of both um, digital imaging, so the U of S group here in Saskatoon, and then um, uh, down in Florida, they actually purchased a high boy sprayer and equipped it with multiple cameras and dubbed it the Pheno Gator, haha, um, to uh, run over the field once per week and collect uh, digital imaging data there. And so um, it's been an extensive effort. And, and now that uh, a lot of the, the GWAS and molecular analysis is taking place, um, we're starting to see some very promising results come out of this. Uh, one of the other early efforts was to characterize the genetic diversity using GBS methodology. And again, this was Dr. Parkin's group that helped uh, helped us characterize um, the diversity on a genetic le level. Uh, and out of that, we were able to identify several key families um, uh, for various traits or, or strong adaptation to various geographies um, that have helped us understand the population structure better. Um, this is an ongoing effort um, with our West Sacramento team now. Uh, we have a molecular program there, uh, and they'll be helping us identify diversity in our current breeding pipeline, um, and especially as we get into hybrids, looking at heterotic pools uh, and things like that. Um, one of the key efforts uh, under the current DFCC program, and this is with Vicki Roslinski and um, Christina Eink is the development of um, improved uh, hybrid parental lines, particularly restore lines. And so the picture on the left is uh, a set of new restorers in Carinata using the Ogira system, um, some of which were selected to combine with numerous new seed uh, CMS females. Um, and those are currently being grown in Chile to produce new test hybrids and um, we're excited to see where that uh, program is able to take us. At the same time we've been looking at uh, first generation hybrids in Carinata and to date uh, the results have been very promising. Um, one observation that was quite clear were that the hybrids were much more vigorous throughout their whole growth cycle uh, than the corresponding OP uh, lines. Uh, some of the hybrids also expressed about one week earlier maturity uh, while not losing yield potential uh, compared with the commercial OP that we currently have. Um, and perhaps most exciting is that several varieties or several hybrid um, entries um, also had greater than 20 percent uh, yield potential consistently compared with our current commercial OP. So great, uh, great starting point in the hybrid program, we felt. Um, because Carinata is a crop grown in rotation, as I mentioned, uh, in the winter months, and this will be the scenario for South America as well as the Southeast US, uh, having earlier mature, maturing varieties will be advantageous. And so one of the priorities we've been working on is developing Carinata with 10 to 14 days uh, earlier maturing in these environments without any substantial loss of yield potential and have made good progress towards that end. Um, currently, as I mentioned, we have material that's about seven or maybe slightly more days earlier um, and want to push that uh, even a little further if possible. Um, because 
Carinata's primary use is as a biofuel feedstock. Um, having high oil content uh, in the grain is also a uh, important priority for us. And so on the right, uh, the graph shows that uh, we have made good and steady progress in our advanced material. Um, so the green is the um, average of oil content among advanced lines uh, in tested in Uruguay compared with a common check over those years. And um, just for reference, um, right now in our commercial just for reference, um, right now in our commercial program, we aim to have 45% oil content or better on average. Uh, over over farm in our commercial program we aim to have 45 percent oil content or better on average uh, over over farms um, and so far have been able to achieve that the average is typically between 45 and 47 percent oil um, so we want to maintain and continue to um, improve on on that trade um, turn out typically uh, or at least the advanced lines we're developing are a yellow seed coat uh, ranging to maybe a light brown and so um, typically those are lower fiber types and slightly higher oil than the uh, brown seeded counterparts. And lastly, um, just wanted to touch on um, some of the geographies we've been screening in. Geographies we've been screening in. Um, some of the geographies we've been screening in. Um, as I mentioned, South America is our fastest growing area. And uh, along with that is um, an increase in our efforts in uh, germplasm development there uh, in Uruguay, Argentina, and Paraguay. Um, as well, uh, the Southeast US has a lot of R&D efforts going on right now, and we'll continue that um, uh, effort uh, going forward. Europe is a bit of a different scenario in that uh, the rotation is going in after winter barley or winter wheat, uh, seeded mid to late June, and going all the way to uh, the end of October or, or early November for harvest. And so primarily the testing efforts have taken place in Southern France uh, in, in that geography to date. Um, and then in Australia, we're looking at um, uh, Queensland or Northern New South Wales as our primary target geographies to start and are working through our canola team there um, for testing. So with that, I hope that uh, presentation uh, is somewhat of interest to you and um, kind of gives you a picture of some of the progress over the last um, nine or 10 years that uh, has taken place in the Karen Auto program. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hello, uh, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Rex, for hosting this wonderful session. My name is Ji Tao Zhou. I am a principal research officer at the National Research Council in Saskatoon. I have the pleasure 
to serve as uh, uh, your moderator for this uh, uh, Q&A session. And we have received quite a number of uh, for questions and uh, uh, we probably won't have time to answer all of them, but you are encouraged to join the net network lunch. If you have uh, more questions and uh, there you can, uh, uh, the, the speakers will be there as well. Now, the first question was addressed to Christopher uh, uh, Hall. And unfortunately, uh, Chris, uh, Christoph uh, cannot be, uh, uh, was not able to uh, join us in this, in this panel, as you understand. Uh, the time. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm here. Oh, yeah. pardon me. That's great, Christopher. OK, yep. I, I did not know you were aware of that. Thank you very much for making it. I must be very late in Germany. Hmm. So the question to you, Christopher, Christoph, was it, uh, are there variations in the level of uh, camouflage in different canola cultivars? Um, there are different camp roles, but um, as you can see uh, in the press, other as you could see in the presentation, uh, we we were able to identify only one to be responsible for the bitter off taste. So we are still working on this, but um, we are, we will also check uh, other camp roll compounds for the bitter off taste. Uh, but uh, there are also some publications about chemical glycosides, and uh, so far they are mainly astringent. Um, so in this case, it really looks like um, this, this sp specific compound is the only reason for the bitter of taste. Yeah, uh, pardon me. So the question was um, whether there is a, the, the difference in natural variation uh, in the level yep, of the yep. camera. Yes. Yes, there also is. Um, but we still investigate. Um, yeah, this is uh, if there is a, a difference because of the uh, location they're grown or if there is a uh, yeah, different in the <coughs> DNA. So there's the investigation on this going on. Thank you uh, very much, Christoph. And the next, we have uh, several questions uh, uh, that are directed to uh, Dr. Neil. And I will combine some of the questions uh, together. Um, it, it concerns about uh, the blend with cold pressed uh, canola oil. So, um, the, there are questions on what are uh, why is a cold uh, canola oil selected instead of the um, commonly hexane extracted canola oil being used in the blend? And is there cold? The second uh, aspect is is a cold press uh, process happening in uh, Malaysia? And and, and thirdly, uh, what are the challenges of doing the cold pressing uh, canola oil extraction? Oh, thank you, Dr. Chow. Um, well, basically, um, honestly, it's all about commercial differentiation. You know, I mean, we wanted to have a product that is commercially different. We already have a cold press canola oil uh, cooking oil. So we may as well blend that, you know, instead of creating another one, right? And it gives a, I mean, everybody loves cold press, right? I mean, it's a, it's a marketing gimmick, if you, if you don't mind. Um, cold pressing is sometimes difficult because we need to get the temperatures below 50 degrees for the oil. So sometimes our temperatures are around 35 ambient. So we do have a cooler. You know, when we can't get, you know, we, we will cool down the seat if we have to. Yeah, it's not that difficult, but basically it's just a bit of a commercial gimmick. But of course, the cold press oil has, um, in our opinion, a better taste profile. Uh, it usually tastes very, very good. So. I mean, of course, that's debatable, but we, we think it's a good product. But commercially, obviously, cold press is going to sound a lot better than hot press or solvent or something. You know, the, you know, the green recovery is going to come, and uh, you know, nobody wants to use high carbon footprint stuff, right? So this is the cold press stuff is half the carbon footprint, if that means anything. Maybe in the future, not now. Now, in term, you had also mentioned that your target uh, price. So is your target uh, price, retail price, equals uh, the same as a retail price? 
Yeah, we our retail price is around two what two dollars eighty cents a Canadian a kilo. I mean, if you compare it with palm olin, that's subsidized. So sometimes there's about one eighty to two dollars Canadian a kilo. So we are about maybe forty percent higher. That's why you know we're asking the government, why don't you subsidize this product, which is healthier, uh, instead of subsidizing palm palm oil alone, which has absolutely no omega three and very high in saturators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's our pitch, you know. And I, I believe the the Canadian government has actually talked to the Malaysian government, and they are quite interested to proceed with this project. They think it's a win-win situation for Canada and Malaysia, which I really think it is, you know, in many ways. So if I get it correctly, the price differential between uh, palm, uh, palm olin and canola olin is about 40%? Yes, about that, yeah, right now. Yeah, so it's okay. you know, still not cheap, but it's affordable. I mean, canola oil per se is even higher, right? Because there's the 300 US dollar gap or what, 400, 500 US dollar, uh, Canadian dollar gap between palm olin and canola oil. So if you use it as a 100% blend, I mean, 100%, it's going to be even more expensive. It's going to be almost double. But if you blend it 40%, obviously, you don't, you know, price is much more uh, acceptable. So we, we are trying to use the blend for cost uh, saving as well as making it healthier, as well as making it more stable, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of the healthier or stable um, for oil in through cold press uh, versus uh, a conventional uh, extraction procedure, do you think it's because of the oil, the fatty acid itself, or other components in the oil that made that time, type of a quality differences? Um. Well, you know, we, we have solvent extraction plants as well, you know, um, so we understand the whole process. The problem with solvent extraction plant is that uh, for canola, you have to subject it to quite high temperatures, you know, you have to heat it up in a, you know, essentially in a cooker at 120 degrees for half an hour, then you pre-press it and then you go through a solvent plant, you heat it up again to 100 degrees for another 30 minutes or, you know, or more. And I, I think Rex knows this very well. You know, he, he was uh, running around with those extracting plants, telling the owners, no, 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 that's bad, that's bad, don't do that. You know, so he knows all about that. So that is not going to give a very good quality product, right? You more or less you know, kill the oil in the meal. So if by doing cold pressing, uh, you don't kill the oil, you don't kill the meal. So it's uh, the best of everything, right? Thank you very much, Dr. Neil. And the next question um, is directed to Dr. Chen. Um, you had mentioned uh, several aspects of uh, new, um, nutraceutical uh, properties of uh, punicic acid. Are there any negative F effects of this particular fatty acid that are known in the literature? Uh, so far, no. Yeah, um, for human use or animal trials, no. Okay, that's, that's great to hear. <laughs> and the next question that also um, is that whether there are, are there existing examples of a niche market canola varieties for the nutraceutical market? If you could comment on that question, please. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, for that uh, pharm pharmaceutical ones, uh, uh, as I mentioned, one company actually contacted me. They they have some uh, exper uh, They did some trial with the patients with uh, pomegranate seed oil, and they found some uh, for some 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 patients with some disease. They do not allow me to uh, tell the information, but uh, I read that papers published papers and sounds. Uh, looks promising and what they are doing as a food company they want to produce uh, uh, products for nutraceutical uh, use not uh, for treated disease but more like a healthy food or uh, a special uh, ingredients uh, or uh, some functional foods for this kind of patients and obviously uh, that's a popular disease in, in many countries so yeah Okay. And they also particularly interested in the canola one because they think canola oil originally is a GMO first, most of canola oil GMO, and second is broadly and used in food as a safety, as a very safe oil already. So yeah, they are interested. That's the reason. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the next question is addressed to, to uh, Dr. Bennett. 
um, is you mentioned that most of the Carolina currently are grown in South America, some in Florida, you mentioned as well. So are these mostly uh, grown in non-irrigated areas? Yes, that's correct. Uh, it's mostly non-irrigated areas. Um, typically in the Southeast US, we have high levels of rainfall, so um, moisture is not a problem. Um, typically also in South America, this last couple of years has been in a bit of a drought cycle, but um, but of course that will will change. And um, yeah, most most farms will continue to be non-irrigated. Um, so you have uh, in your presentation you emphasize this as a biofuel feed stock. And uh, can you comment on you know the biofuels used either the by diesel type or the the so-called hydrogenation derived renewable diesel, these are two different process. In terms of these two different process, what Coronada uh, bring to, you know, some sort of advantage to it be there? Can you? Yeah, uh, just to comment. So yeah, it can, can and has been tested in all different processes. So the biodiesel fame process, the HVO, hydrogenated vegetable oil process, which is a very fastly growing sector right now, there's a lot of investment going in in United States and in the European Union there, and also in biojet fuel. So um, it's been tested in all three. Um, um, primarily right now, the market, uh, because it's being imported to France, it's being marketed in the HVO uh, sector. So uh, those technologies or second generation biofuels. Um, and really the um, as I mentioned in the presentation, the value of the oil comes from the positioning with the greenhouse gas savings. So uh, because it's positioned as a non-food, uh, non-GM crop and, and just the way the platform's set up, uh, that's, that's the thing that extracts a lot of premiums for, for the oil itself. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, all your panelists for answering these uh, questions. and. Um, I also thank you for the other participation of the audience of this uh, conference. It has been a wonderful uh, session and uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you in, in the network lounge on the next session. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much Chitao and all our speakers. That was great. Um, next up, we've got a, a section called uh, Curtis's Corner. So you guys probably all know Curtis Rempel, Dr. Curtis Rempel. He's been at the Canola Council now for about eight years, really pushing the boundaries and looking at opportunities for this crop. And so um, I'm looking forward to our next uh, couple of presenters and Curtis will be chairing that session. So over to you, Curtis. Hi, I'm Curtis Rempel, the Vice President for Crop Production and Innovation at the Canola Council of Canada, and welcome to my corner. One of the priorities for the Canola Council of Canada is to identify innovation gaps or opportunities for canola production and end uses. The Canola Week is designed to facilitate the exchange of ideas, develop research priorities, build research networks and partnerships, and communicate research to stakeholders. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from two speakers who are in different spaces or somewhat interconnected. One funds innovation and one is an innovator. Scott Day directs a venture capital firm that seeks to provide much needed capital to translate innovation and innovative ideas into commercially available and viable products or services. And Dr. Mark Hilmer conduct, directs and conducts research on expanded expanding uses for canola. A venture capitalist is a private equity investor that provides capital or money to companies which have high growth potential in exchange for ownership in the company. VC firms typically invest in people and ideas before they qualify for bank loans or public equity and therefore play a significant role in bringing innovation to market. Scott Day is a farmer from Deloraine, Manitoba. Scott also has direct farming experience in Australia, the EU, and the former Soviet Union. For 24 years, Scott was an ag rep and crop diversification specialist for Manitoba agriculture. In 2011, Scott left this vocation to start and manage a venture capital firm focused entirely on agriculture, fall line capital, 
based in San Mateo, California, the heart of Silicon Valley. Fall Line invests in farmland across the US as well as new ag technologies around the world. I would encourage you to read Scott's bio on the conference webpage. The bio further highlights Scott's many contributions to zero tillage and conservation agriculture. For many people, the documentary Blue Planet 2 brought the problem of plastics and their accumulation in the environment to the forefront. The accumulation of plastics may be the next largest problem facing our planet after climate change. Many people think that plastics are recycled effectively and we are good to go. A recent study by Environment and Climate Change Canada showed that only 9% of plastics in Canada are recycled and the rest are incinerated, landfilled or worse. 18 trillion pounds of plastic have been produced to date and 18 billion pounds flow into the ocean. Plastics for packaging is a $375 billion industry. And in 2016, McKinsey calculated that single use plastics have an 80 to $120 billion annual market value. So plastics are economically important and they have revolutionized our world and have greatly improved our day-to-day -day lives. But they rely on fossil fuels for manufacture they break down very slowly and their breakdown products have potential to bioaccumulate and be harmful to, to species and humans around the planet. Plastics produced by plants, fungi and bacteria may be a solution as they, they have the potential to have a better environmental footprint and can be made to degrade after their functional use has passed. Canola protein has been shown to be a useful pr product uh, starting block or starting material for bio-based plastics. And this research was reported at a previous innovation day by Dr. Chung Lu at AAFC in collaboration with McMaster University and University of Manitoba. Today, Dr. Mark Hilmer will talk about his, country, his center and the research they are conducting. Dr. Hilmer is a professor in at the Faculty of Chemistry in the University of Minnesota. He is currently the McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Chemistry, where he heads a research group focused on the synthesis and self-assembly of multifunctional polymers. He is also the director for the Center for Sustainable Polymers at the University of Minnesota, which is a National Science Foundation Center for Chemical Innovation. In 2020, Dr. Hillmeyer also received a Bright Scientist Award for Research in Material Sciences. I also you encourage you to read his bio at the conference webpage. As we start moving to this session, I would also encourage or remind you to ask your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you. Well, uh, hello everyone, this is live. So uh, we can expect maybe a few little hiccups, but uh, I'm very pleased to be here. And thanks very much, Curtis, for that uh, very nice intro. Um, I'm, uh, I, have, I wear two hats and I, I still farm with my dad and my family in Deloraine, Manitoba in the summer. And I work out of the head office of Fall Line Capital in San Mateo in, in the winter. And I actually arrived here on Tuesday. So I'm still getting used to uh, life in Southern California during a lockdown. And our company, Fall Line Capital, uh, it's already been explained, but we started as a private equity firm looking at investment in farmland in the US in about 2012 and adding value to the farm based on our experience and, and knowledge in farming. And we also got into ag tech investing to support you know, the enhancement of the farms themselves. And that's actually become a, a much bigger part of our company uh, than it initially was. We still have the majority of our capital invested in farmland, but now more energy is going into tech investing, and I'll explain that in a second. We're a very small team in relation to the significant amount of money that we manage. <clears throat> and how I got involved was Clay Mitchell, one of the managing directors. He and I were guest speakers in Australian no-till farmer conferences a number of years ago. And incidentally, I was speaking about why I grow genetically modified canola in a conservation ag system, and he was talking about precision ag. And we became friends on that tour in Australia. And that's how he, uh, uh, how I ended up when he invited me to be part of Fall Line. So there's the two founding directors, uh, Baptiste and I are, other, are the other directors. We have a CFO and then these are four staff in the field. So uh, 
it, it, it's a very lean team. We're looking to add to it, but uh, this is the group that makes the decisions on where we buy farms and what technology to invest in. The next few slides are gonna be direct answers to questions that Curtis posed to me before the conference uh, that uh, he, he wanted addressed by, uh, by my experience, I guess. And one of the questions was how much money goes into ag tech uh, venture capital investments. And in 2018 and 2019, there was each $20 billion US invested in ag tech. Um, and that's in you know, our part of the world as far as Asia and, and uh, the former Soviet Union. I'm, I'm not sure if we have numbers on those, but that is a six fold increase in the amount invested in venture capital ag since 2012. And that's from uh, Ag Funder, which is a, a website and a group based here that actually has some really close ties to Western Canada, but keeps track of ag tech investing and food tech investing around the world. Some of the significant investments over this short period of time that's maybe captured a lot of the attention was Climate Corp purchased by Monsanto. John Deere bought Blue River in 2017 for, for 305 million. And I can tell you some of our farmers this year were where the Blue River uh, technology was being tested on John Deere equipment. It's made the leap to the sprayers and, and the tractors for autonomous uh, direction and, and on the spot spraying. And, and it's really exciting to see where that's going. And then Corteva bought granular software for 300 million in 2017. And we were an investor in granular, an early investor. And what happened as a result of that is, you know, this was obviously a, a big uh, of investment and it garnered a lot of attention and people saw that this little company called Fallline was one of those investors. And that's when we started to get a lot of inbound uh, inquiries for, for tech investing when they saw that we had been an investor in Granular. Egg tech, as far as a desirable space for investment right now, you know, it, it actually provides a relatively secure and tangible opportunity compared to the current chaos with, <laughs> with many of the traditional investments out there right now. Like, uh, you know, are you going to invest in commercial real estate space, uh, entertainment, even the automobile industry, the, the energy industry, these things are really being disrupted at this time. But food is forever and technology will always be appreciated, uh, you know, as we provide more alternatives, more healthier options and so on. And some of the main categories generated, generating interest in the space are alternative protein sources. And we know about certainly about plant-based proteins as far as replacing hamburger and that sort of thing. But recently there's been a couple of companies, uh, one just recently in Denver that got uh, funding for creating steaks and, and sliceable meats from mycelium, the, you know, the kind of the roots of fungus. And there's another company at the same time received funding to do the same with leather, that they're going to create leather from mycelium out of fungus. So, uh, we, we know about the plant-based protein thing, but there's protein sources coming from microbes that feed off of methane and, and these mycelium from fungus. It's, it's becoming a much bigger thing than maybe we realize at this point. Obviously, drones and robotics are, a, are of an inter interest to investors. There's gene editing, and I put that as a kind of a uh, reminder that this is, once again, a very diverse field. This is not just GMO or CRISPR, you're gonna be hearing from an epigenetic company in a few uh, later on this morning, and we've invested in a company that's doing a, a methyl, methylation of uh, on DNA that's creating epigenetic traits that are just amazing and incredibly fast uh, gene editing. There's gene editing through the chloroplast now. Um, so th there's many choices to make these improvements or, or modifications for much less money, much greater efficiency. Then you have computational biology, which is when we're gathering all this data on stuff, now we know kind of what it means. You know, we have vaccines against specific genes. Um, this is all the result of, of this huge data that we're getting on, you know, the building blocks of life and being able to do something specific about it. And then obviously remote imaging and precision ag remains interesting too. Curtis asked how many firms are out there and it, this is not, you know, a lot of us are private equity firms. We're not really out in the public that much. We have our investors and we work on their behalf, but I, I know that there are at least dozens and dozens of ag tech firms in North America. And that's because we actually work with a lot of them as co-partners in specific projects. You know, there's very few startups that only have one investor. And from our standpoint, we like to have uh, partners that bring tools and resources to the package and also share the risk. 
uh, I know there's at least 100 worldwide that are interested in ag tech uh, venture capitalism. And then you have literally thousands of VC firms that do other things and do also have some investments in agriculture. So uh, it's a it's a large pool of money. Uh, obviously, it's it's growing very rapidly, and I don't see that to, you know declining or diminishing anytime soon. Many of the ag tech VT, VCs are connected to larger ag and life sciences companies like Syngenta Ventures, Bayer Leaps, Continental Grain, Cavella Ventures is the VC wing of Wilbur Ellis. Um, they're, they're all companies that we've worked, or they're all venture capital firms that we've worked as, with as well in some of our tech investments. And of course, they, they bring tremendous resources to the package. And it's uh, obvious that uh, they have some very successful uh, projects that they've been behind. Several of the ag tech VCs are managed by, you know, experienced ag industry professors. A lot of them are, uh, or sorry, professionals. A lot of them are former professors or executives of, you know, the big companies. And uh, uh, they come with, uh, you know, a really deep ocean of, uh, of experience and, and professional ability. And uh, that's why it's great to partner with them. Uh, for us, uh, uh, kind of the farmers in the, in the VC world with the professors in the VC world. And some of these VT, uh, ag tech VCs are actually family offices that are from very wealthy families that have a division in food uh, investment. And we invest with, uh, uh, in partnership with some of those family offices too. And then the, the firms tend to be located in, in similar regions to where much of the ag innovation is taking place right now, such as St. Louis and Boston, Chicago, Durham. Certainly a lot of them is in the Bay Area as well. And I don't know a lot about the Canadian industry because it's not actually where I work, but uh, I know Calgary and Toronto has some, uh, is the base for some ag tech VCs. I was reading there's one in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island as well. So it's, it's quite diverse and, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a growing area. So Curtis asked kind of the specifics of what we fund and, and how much we would be willing to do. And I, I can't really speak on behalf of many of the other groups because I don't know their rules, but I would say we try to avoid an investment below a half a million because of just, you know, it, 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 it takes away the, you, you see we're a small group, if we had a lot of investments that were really small, it would be hard to manage at all. And so if you're a startup, you generally need to scrounge together a bunch of money from friends and family and, and whatever to, to get those few, first few hundred thousand dollars. And, and then it kind of, you know, gives you legitimacy and, and VC firms will step in after that. However, in the early rounds, not a lot of investment will be greater than $10 million. So there's a, usually a seed round where you get started and then you prove the concept and then you have an A round where maybe you get to market or refine the process and a B round and a C round. By the time you get to a C and a D round, those amounts may be greater than 10 million, but that's kind of the range that you're looking at in the early stages. Uh, we will usually invest, and once again, I don't know the rules of everyone, but you usually invest in a startup as long as it's progressing according to its milestones that they've set out. You know, you, you, you enter this agreement knowing it could be often a long-term relationship. And uh, there are some funds that work under specific time frames that, you know, they have to end the investment in 10 years or something like that. However, most are not like that. And as a result, as long as the the, the startup is progressing, uh, you will usually stick with it until there's a reasonable exit, whether it's sold to a bigger company or has a public offering or something like that. Uh, you know, we, we tend to stay with them uh, through, through, the, through the whole phases if we are an early investor. We're not always an early investor. There are other VCs that would exit um, earlier and there are VCs that will not enter into an investment until it's much further down the pi pipeline. So specifically what we're looking for is obviously a potential in a startup, you know, is this got great potential? Uh, it's kind of a no brainer, but we have invested in about 23 startups over the last six years and they're all still alive, which I guess is kind of a record in venture capitalist, uh, venture capitalism and um, uh, you know, the, the investment startup world. And I think part of that is our practical experience as farmers on our board and or in our group and we can, you know, make choices and decisions that are kind of uh, uh, a little different than other groups in that we have this really practical approach as to whether that thing that that person says they're going to build is really all that relevant. 
We also highly value the team, whatever the staff or group that is creating this, this new thing. Um, you know, sometimes it's impossible to, to figure out whether this is actually going to work or not at this point, you know, you're that early. But if you have a lot of um, in faith in the team and their abilities and their ability to work together and do things, then generally good things come from that. So a lot of effort put in what the team is made up of. You need to have good protection of intellectual property. If you don't, then it's not really an investable startup. And we've seen a number of great ideas, even one a few weeks ago that involved reduction of fertilizer up to 75%. But the protection of the intellectual property is, is very doubtful. So it's, it's a great idea, but it's not necessarily a good investment from, from our standpoint. Now, one of the things that's kind of what I've seen over the few years we've been involved is the team, uh, you know, the, the team that's creating this, the, the new uh, idea, will they take direction and input? And, and it almost is a cliche that people that are the inventors are not the people that should be running the company eventually on, eventually when it gets to market or whatever. And so you wanna have confidence that the people that you're working with at the beginning are willing to step aside when it moves to the next phase of production or marketing or, or not, necessarily, not necessarily step aside, but add other professionals that will be able to, to manage those aspects of any new business. We, we try to stick to science-based rather than market-based ideas. Um, and we avoid investments that are vulnerable to policy and fashionable trends. And one of those, I just thought of uh, a few years ago, we looked at a, a source of fiber for food, just a, a general fiber additive that was plant-based that would have great potential if the US government had prohibited some industrial sources of fiber in, in your diet. And when, uh, election occurred that changed and the industrial fiber was allowed to be maintained so this natural source of fiber that whole industry kind of collapsed at that moment now it might come back again and it might be a great thing but from an investment standpoint it's a little too vulnerable so just a couple of, of well I'm going to go through some of the really cool investments we've made because they are quite uh, quite interesting and the first one I'm mentioned is Greenlight, which has been, a, I think it's been in the news in Canada a little bit. This is a company that creates RNA, RNAi uh, products, which is uh, interrupts the RNA from transmitting or carrying out the, the instructions of the, DNA, of the DNA of an organism. So really it, it kind of silences a gene that uh, is vital for the uh, existence of whatever um, living organism that you're targeting. And in this case, their first product, which will probably be going to market next year, is uh, a product that kills Colorado potato beetle unbelievably well at very low doses, very little expense, and no effect on the other, any other insects. <clears throat> and we could go on talking about this for a long time because Greenlight is also doing mRNA products, which is exactly what the Pfizer and uh, Moderna COVID vaccine is. And Greenlight has the protocol or the platform to create these vaccines very inexpensively and accurately. And uh, so we're quite excited about, you know, the validation of the technology when it comes to what Pfizer and Moderna have produced. And Greenlight has vaccines on its radar and, and does have some COVID vaccines in the pipeline, but it's a very small company and they wanted to prove out their technology in agriculture first. But overall, this is fantastic validation for the product. Um, they have identified RNA products to kill flea beetles and canola. Uh, they've also identified the possibility to con control sclerotinia as well. And this will be with products that are completely inert to other things in the environment. The problem is getting the, these products into the flea beetle or you know, into the sclerotinia disease bodies. Um, the, the Colorado potato beetle, they discovered a way to um, you know, that it's absorbed into the gut and, and took a lot of work to figure out the pH of, of the gut and all that sort of thing. And now that they've cracked that code, they can kill the, the beetle, Colorado potato beetle very easily. Challenges exist on how to get it into a flea beetle or those sort of things. But as, as far as the potential to kill, it, it, is, it is there. Uko is a company we invested in a few weeks ago based in Israel. Um, <clears throat> they have uh, taken, uh, They've looked at the lesions in thousands of patients that are human subjects, I guess, that are susceptible to gluten, to that have celiac disease or other gluten sensitivities. 
and they reconstructed gluten so that it no longer has any health impacts on humans. And they've been able to put this gluten in corn and uh, their field trials actually growing in the field will be starting in the next few weeks. But the, 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 the lab creation, the corn with the gluten, um, they produce amazing looking bread. Uh, I guess it tasted just like wheat bread. And uh, you know, it, it, it's opening up kind of a, a door for all kinds of therapeutic and also um, you know, re reduction in, in these allergens. Uh, their next product will be uh, obviously with peanuts and peanut allergy, a therapeutic there. And they would expect to put this safe gluten as they call it in wheat. It's just, you know, wheat is a very complicated genome and it was much easier to do it in corn and then be able to segregate it uh, because corn, you, you know, obviously doesn't have any other competition. There, the corn isn't used for flour and bread already. So uh, we're very excited about this company and, and excited to see how the field trials work. Benson Hill is a company that has a unique CRISPR uh, protocol. They have a massive inventory of um, crop genetic uh, characteristics, and they are working with the University of Guelph in Ontario uh, with a Saturn canola program that will have a, a photosynthetic efficiency gene in it, along with several um, quality factors for the um, human market. This is Sound Egg. I'll go through this quickly uh, because they're trying to create a new class of products, uh, chemistries that affect the biology of the plant in, in ways that we generally call them biologicals, but they're actually chemistries. But they've also um, created a new form of epigenetic plant breeding where they apply methyl, uh, methylation properties to seed, you know, simply like a seed coating. And it, you know, it silences certain genes and creates desirable traits without actually you know, editing the material at the cellular level. And then you use epigenetics, like pretty strict back crossing to create a, a, a new variety of, of something that has uh, what we would consider genetic modification, but isn't really connected to the, you know, the, the historical ways of doing it. They've created a, an heirloom tomato a few weeks ago, their first product that was, looks fantastic. It, it, and uh, once again, this is something that you know, we should be able to see on the marketplace in the next couple of years. In the interest of time, I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly, but this is uh, one of our recent investments. It's Verge, and this is out of Kindersley, Saskatchewan. Uh, it was called First Pass. Now it's being uh, rebranded as a company Verge, and it is a software for the most efficient root pathways or pathway management of fields. <coughs> and, you know, important for multi units working in a field topography all these sort of things and it's you know just gives you an example of the broad range of things that we invest in uh, there's a polymer speaker right after me and we are investing in a company that uh, applies a, a highly biodegradable plastic for regular row crops this is corn uh, we had this planted in northern wisconsin this year and i think we won the yield corn rate yield record at 270 bushels with this plastic, it, it's quite an exciting thing to be involved with. It's old technology, but we're actually refining it to be applicable to broader acres here in Western Canada and the Northern Plains. We've invested in two drone companies recently, uh, which was not something we planned to do because there was so many drones, like where do you invest? But these two companies have built spraying systems from the ground up, really cool systems. You know, the slide in the back of a pickup that are self-tendering, all these sort of things. And so these are, investments we made in the last few weeks as well. Uh, one of the last ones I'll mention is Impossible. We were an early investor in Impossible Foods. And the first time that I uh, tested one, I was actually at the office in front of the executive and they brought in a chef. I ate the burger, it tasted awful. It, and you know, I had to hide my emotions in front of everybody and thought this is going nowhere. And then a few times later, I, I eat an Impossible Burger at a, at a restaurant. This is a picture I took and it tasted fantastic. And the point is that these plant alternative uh, meats and, and uh, food products, they have a massive war chest of investment money and, and scientists behind them, and they're getting better quicker and faster than, than even they were, you know, even faster than we were expecting based on what they told us. So, you know, whatever your impression is or thoughts are about this industry at this, this point in time, it's changing dramatically and has a lot of resources behind it and they're, they're getting better every day. The last thing I'll mention is kind of the future and I see a lot of 
things that, you know, we may invest in these things, we may not. There's a lot of things going around with spectral imaging as far as soil testing and crop diagnostics and animal health and that sort of thing. And that actually will probably end up being a feature on your phone in a few years. Uh, we're looking at a number of automatic pest traps right now that are really fascinating, that'll be able to tell you how many sclerotinia spores are in your canola field and, and phone your phone the moment a threshold's hit. Um, there's a group out of, uh, well, out of Australia that's got a commercial version of a trap that is automatically telling you how many armyworms are there. So we're, we're getting really uh, uh, close to having scouting automated. Um, I mentioned the designer proteins and then peptides are becoming a big part of the conversation now, which they act similar to the RNA products, but um, are obviously a kind of a different source of, of potential for pesticides, but uh, work in a similar way in silencing genes and silencing some of the undesirable things you want. So with that, I'll leave it to, uh, for now and, and look forward to your questions in a few minutes. Hello? Hello, my name is Mark Hillmeyer. I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota. And today I'd like you to give you an overview of the National Science Foundation Center for Sustainable Polymers. It can be argued that we all need plastic. Uh, these are remarkable modern materials that do things like protect our foods, lightweight our transportation. You are probably well aware that a face mask is an amalgamation of many different polymers that are helping protect the spread, uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, but certainly, we don't need all plastic, uh, meaning that there are certain dematerialization approaches where we can get rid of these kinds of materials and uh, where they're not uh, can have useful substitutes that do not uh, have the negative consequences that plastics can have in the environment. And that's because not all plastic ends up where we want it. And unfortunately, we can just walk outside and see our landscapes are littered with this material and unfortunately can end up in places that cause ecological damage uh, like the oceans. To learn more about this, you can certainly read a lovely article in the National Geographic about um, with the title, uh, We Depend on Plastic, uh, but now we're drowning in it. And I think that kind of summarizes the kind of sentiments uh, that we uh, have generally uh, as, a, as a society. Uh, this next article called The Production, Use, and Fate of All Plastics Ever Made really kind of highlights what's happening since the dawn of the polymer kind of industry. Uh, back uh, in 1967, there were about 23 million uh, tons of uh, plastic, uh, million tons of plastic being uh, produced. And in 2017, that has skyrocketed to 400 million metric tons. Uh, just the size of the yellow arrow compared to the blue gives you a sense of how much of this is ultimately uh, discarded. In fact, very little is recycled uh, a, a small fraction is incinerated, but most of it is discarded, and that ends up where we don't want it. Well, why are these materials produced on such a large scale, and why are they so uh, popular? Uh, well, they're amazing materials, lightweight, protective, strong, transparent, moldable, insulating, disposable, and probably most importantly, they're, they're, um, they're, they're inexpensive. Um, they're easy to get incredible properties at relatively low cost. And you can see that this cat is benefiting from the thermal insulating properties of this silicone polymer. Um, you can't really take pictures like this anymore, but I like this as an example of how amazing materials, these amazing properties these materials have. But it's at the end of life that we have a problem. And in just in the case of plastic packaging, um, what we find, uh, studies have shown that um, nearly three quarters of the material is either landfilled or leaks into the environment. And this has economic costs. So for example, um, there's a hundred billion annual loss in value after first short-term use, meaning that yes, when you use plastic for food packaging or whatever, it's useful in that short lifespan. But then when you're done with it, it usually gets discarded and still is a useful material. Moreover, there's a cost of so-called after-use externalities uh, clean up environmental costs, 
uh, ecological costs that are uh, you know, roughly estimated at billions of dollars a year. Uh, this is produced by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, and uh, it's under the heading of the New Plastics Economy. And I think uh, I agree with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that there's an incredible opportunity to enhance system effectiveness to achieve better, better economic and environmental outcomes while continuing to harness the many benefits of plastics. And I think there's three key things to be concerned with. First, decouple from fossil fuels, and that's where bio-based products uh, come into play. Uh, reduce the environmental impact of the materials if they do get into the environment. And three is establish more sensible after-use options of these materials, which can include recycling, can include uh, clean incineration, uh, and can include uh, converting the materials back to the starting from materials from which they came. As you can see, when we if we keep uh, progressing at this pace, uh, we're going to end up, the polymer production is going to keep increasing, but the share of the oil budget, the carbon budget, and uh, the amount of plastic in the ocean are going to be uh, dramatically increased. And uh, the, the question really is, can we do better? The issue is we need to do it, we need to do better at the same cost. A few years ago, I uh, wrote a perspective on this topic of the promise of plastics from plants. And the idea here being is that on the decoupling from fossil fuel side, um, we need to do work. And the work that we need to do is use the modern tools of chemistry to try to understand better how to use plant-based products and convert them into materials that are competitive. And so I seek to discover new polymers with outstanding properties that are comparable and even better superior to their petrochemical analogs. And I think that opportunity uh, exists and uh, we'll argue that, um, that more basic research needs to be done to harness that, uh, that incredible opportunity. So my motivations as center director and as the director of a research group is to advance science, to build a strong foundation. And I think there we really have to focus on, 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 on fundamental uh, research, understanding at the molecular level what is possible and uh, determining what is possible, but also remembering we have to keep an eye toward what is practical. Uh, because these are such low cost materials and we really want to in, you know solve important problems now but we also have to be sure we're watching out for the impact that solutions have on future generations because i'm not so sure that was taken fully to heart at the dawn of the polymer uh, era plastics era um, and of course i'm very keenly interested on helping prepare tomorrow's scientists to make impactful contributions in their own careers through training they can get in the center so Basic contributions, economic considerations, environmental concerns, and the intended consequence of training the next generation of researchers are really motivating aspects uh, for me. So as we all know, the current paradigm, we dig fossil resources. Chemical engineers actually do a really great job of highly efficiently converting them into, into uh, molecules that can be turned into materials that we use and need every day. But the problem is that at the end of life, is simply not sustainable. The beginning of life and the end of life for plastics is not sustainable. So in the Center for Sustainable Polymers, we take a much more kind of cyclic economy view where if we can use biomass to make molecules that we already know, but also new molecules that can be used in new ways to make the same kinds of products that we're used to, but where they have more sensible end of life uh, options, whether it's uh, composting, recycling, even, even, even incineration. The time is right. There's a serious confluence of effort right now, not only in academia, which, which I'm a part, but also non-governmental organizations like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation raising, <clears throat> raising awareness. Uh, industry is taking a key role in uh, every major chemical manufacturer has a sustainability link on their front page and where their and polymers play a key role and plastics play a key role in many of their efforts. And then, of course, government plays a role in not only supporting research, but also in changing policies by the way which we uh, use uh, these uh, plastic materials. So we're in the academic side. We think there's a big confluence of effort right now to make big change in the area of sustainable polymers. And we work on the basic research side. So our grand challenge is to discover efficient and precision conversions of renewable raw materials into innovative polymer products that outperform the current suite of non-sustainable polymers from a combined functional, environmental, and cost perspective. The little infographic kind of tells you what we do. We are interested in converting biomass using the modern tools of chemistry, 
to make these polymer molecules, which ultimately get incorporated into products. We don't make products at the University of Minnesota, but we think about products that these materials could go into and how they might have to compete economically to make a real, make a real difference. We've been around for over, uh, uh, over 20 years uh, now, excuse me, over 20 years, over 10 years now. And uh, uh, we were established at the University of Minnesota in 2009. And we received support from the National Science Foundation in 2011, 2014. And we were most recently renewed in what's called a phase two center for chemical innovation in 2019. Uh, the, the center will sunset in 2024, but we have um, uh, so much momentum uh, in this area that we are actively pursuing other opportunities to support the mission of the center. We can parameterize, uh, uh, categorize our uh, Grand Challenge uh, research project areas in the following way. Efficient and convertible, efficient and sustainable conversion of biomass to polymer ingredients. Uh, so how do we, how do we get biomass in this things that we really want and uh, can use? Uh, we want to make high-performance, sustainable plastics and elastomers. We have to make them that way because they have to compete with incumbent materials to make a difference. And then really at the end of life, polymer degradation, chemical recycling, compatibilization to enhance mechanical recycling um, is really, I think, important aspect of the end of life of polymers. What we've been able to do is really bring together an amalgamation of leading experts in the, in the, in the chemical sciences really from the beginning of a polymer's life, like conversion of biomass and how and how to do that efficiently, maybe through the action of microorganisms, all the way through to polymer processing. And I think by having this vertically integrated center, it really helps us understand the opportunities and limitations in each of these facets of polymer uh, science research, like I said, from beginning, uh, beginning to end. So we have Folks who are interested in metabolic engineering, taking bio-based feedstocks like sugars and oils and being able to have uh, uh, microbes and uh, enzym do enzymatic transformations to make molecules we're interested in, all the way through to polymer processing. When we have a plastic material, how do we injection mold it or extrude it or process it in a way that gives us the properties that we're so keenly interested in? Uh, these are the uh, leading, uh, sorry, these are the senior investigators, but we also support uh, more than 60 graduate student, postdoctoral, and undergraduate uh, researchers in the center who are carrying out uh, the experiments on a on a day to day basis to be able to make these fundamental advances. So what I'd like to do is just give you a few slides on some of the kinds of efforts we do in the center to give you a sense of the things that are, are, are possible. So these are some recent sustainable polymer efforts. Here's an example that was led by Hee Jun Kim. Uh, he Jung is co-advised by myself and Chris Ellison, who's in the Chemical Engineering Materials Science Department here at Minnesota. Um, and we're interested in how can you make a high-performance polyester that has a high glass transition temperature. That means a high softening point, something like polyethylene terephthalate, which is the material found in, in pop bottles. So can we use things like uh, lignin sources, uh, trees, uh, e corn, to put together renewable-based molecules into interesting new structures like the one you see in the lower right, which is a combination of salicylic acid and either glycolic or lactic acid. What we learned is that, yes, we can make that molecule, and yes, it does polymerize to give the polymer that you see there, um, and it actually has an, a really quite nice uh, properties, uh, material properties, and you know, comparable in ways to polyethylene terephthalate, but it is really readily degradable under relatively mild conditions, meaning that potentially, if in the environment or if in a compost kind of situation, it could be uh, biodegraded. So making high-performance materials that can be readily degraded is a tall order, and I think we've made a nice inroad into one of those areas through the work of uh, through the work of Hiju. Another place we're interested in is how can we use waste materials, uh, waste materials from industry that um, have little value but are a byproduct of natural of natural um, uh, consequences of the way they uh, the way they manufacture their uh, their valuable goods. This was supported by uh, Land of Lakes, and one of the byproducts of cheese making is lactose. And could we do something interesting with lactose in the polymer world to make something that had value? So uh, what Larissa uh, Fonseca did was 
she was able to valorize this waste product, lactose, by converting it into a hydrogel material, a material that absorbs many times its weight in water. Uh, you've heard of super absorbent uh, materials, but we're able to do it with this waste sugar product, largely because the sugars are obviously uh, soluble in water. But how we had to hook them together with these red lines here was a polymer chemistry effort. Um, we did it in a very atom economic kind of one pot photo initiated way. And we got some really quite interesting materials uh, by taking uh, literally a waste product called milk permeate from the, from, the, from the cheese manufacturing process to get to this new hydrogel uh, material. Phil Durlam uh, worked, uh, led an effort on how can we use uh, PLA. Now I'm gonna tell you about PLA in just a moment here, but PLA is a renewable polymer um, uh, based on uh, a sugar, uh, based on corn as a feedstock, and it's also compostable. Um, but we made an interesting, what's called star-shaped PLA that allowed us to foam the material. And the, the, the topic was really, could we make a floral foam using a compostable polymer? Many of you know that green floral foam, that is really great for making flower arrangements, but not so great from a degradation uh, standpoint and all uh, petroleum based. So are we able to make a bio-based foamable material? It turns out that PLA inherently is not that foamable, but when you make the star shaped structure, uh, you can do a better job at getting foams. And uh, we needed this unusual polymer structure and we were able to accomplish uh, foaming with uh, carbon dioxide to make some viable uh, floral foam uh, substitutes. It is that polymer PLA that we have spent a lot of time on. This is a polymer that is being commercialized. It's commercialized by NatureWorks, a local company here in Minnesota. And it's an amazing material that comes from corn and can be composted. It's recyclable. Uh, it has a, a very good life cycle analysis profile uh, and has properties that are that are comparable to um, uh, comparable to, uh, for example, polystyrene and polyethylene terephthalate. Because we can polymerize it by adding a variety of these alcohol initiators, we really can control the structure of the material. And that really enabled the floral foam example that I gave you um, uh, in, the last, in the last slide. Um, but I wanted to raise uh, some work that's a little bit older that used PLA because one of the limitations it has is that it's not the toughest polymer uh, around. And so from an impact uh, resistance standpoint, there's work to be done. And many years ago, we actually used vegetable oils as, as toughening agents for PLA. And in this case, we used castor oil directly. And the direct addition to PLA ended up leading to, in the case of a compatibilized system, a really tremendous increase in the toughness of the, of the material. Um, and so I think there's opportunities here for vegetable oils as, uh, as uh, additives as uh, potentially new monomers, as compatibilizers, as many applications where we can take the functionality that comes uh, in vegetable oils and use them positively to enhance the properties of other materials or generate new materials uh, themselves. So I've given you just a small snapshot. Um, if you wanna learn more about kind of our view on the future of sustainable polymers, there's a review perspective article that was published in Macromolecules in uh, 2017 that, that highlights the importance of basic and applied research. Uh, polyolefin fundamental research is where we, what, what got us to where we are now. And I think the fundamental research in bio-based polymers is also going to be very important to get us where we want to be in the future. Um, we talk about life cycle analysis and about the, the responsibility of scientists and, and engineers to think, more, uh, to think harder about sustainability in their own research and in their own uh, uh, products. Uh, so uh, in, in summary, I would say that, um, you know, if we would want sustainable solutions for our uh, plastic planet predicament, uh, we have to think about using abundant renewable resources. We have to make sure we're generating useful molecules because plastics are, are, are things that, that we really do need and they really do contribute positively sustainability, but this, the story is not all rosy. And so we need to understand sensible end of life options. So I'll read that we must emphasize research and development efforts that valorize bio-based resources to give molecules that can be efficiently and cleanly converted into high performance polymers that can be readily recycled or easily degraded in an environmentally innocuous manner. And I argue that sustainable solutions really must be uh, the, the, the future. Um, 
the added caveat is we have to do this inexpensively. And the point is, is that you don't want to make exotic high cost materials to try to replace a relatively uh, high performing and very low cost incumbent uh, material. I'll finish my presentation just by recognizing that uh, all the efforts here in the Center for Sustainable Polymers come from a numerous students and postdoctoral and undergraduate researchers that contribute many collaborators. They're all listed here. And we also benefit from collaborating not only at the University of Minnesota, but at six other uh, partner uh, research uh, institutes and universities, Cornell, Northwestern, Berkeley, Chicago, Washington University in St. Louis and the University of South Dakota. The center is supported by the National uh, Science Foundation. And if you'd like to learn more about our efforts, I encourage you to see csp.umn.edu. And if you're so inclined to follow us on Twitter, where we give highlights of recent research activities. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions in the question and answer session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for two very engaging uh, presentations. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of, uh, a lot to think about and to uh, consider. Uh, Jital, do you have any questions that have come in from the, from any of the participants or, or guests that are listening in this morning? Um, I have not, uh seen one uh, but i have one of my own if i could uh, yep. curtis Start yes I, I, I after. okay i have a question um uh for dr uh, uh Hillmeyer. um you had mentioned that uh castor oil as uh, a toughen uh, toughening agent i uh, presumably uh, because of the hydroxy group of the oil do you have a other example of oil that can function in similar capacity? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you so much, first, for being able to participate in this and also for the, uh, for the question. You know, one of the nice uh, features about uh, castor oil, as you point out, is this, this polar functionality, uh, the hydroxyl group. Uh, certainly, we looked pretty carefully at how the compatibility uh, between the oil and the polymer was reliant upon the functional groups that are in the, in the material. So um, ha having said that, there are ways in unfunctionalized vegetable oils where, you know, just the triglyceride itself, uh, that you can modify them in ways to enhance compatibility with bio-based bio polymers. And we have worked a little bit on that uh, in that area as well. Um, so um, when you blend unfunctionalized oils in general, um, you do get phase separation and it's not as I would say clean as the functionalized uh, castor oil. Um, but that doesn't mean that the story is over there because there are compatibilizers and other molecules that you, you can use to enhance kind of the system effectiveness. And um, I think, you know, as the modern tools of the chemistry, you know, progress in terms of modifying oils, epoxy groups, hydroformylation, other kinds of chemistries, I think the opportunities there are pretty uh, are pretty interesting and, 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 and potentially quite important. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I also have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe Mark, I'll start with you and then, uh, then I'll move over to Scott just to get, get some engagement going. And these are not necessarily, um, Mark, um, um, completely scientific, maybe looking for some opinion too, because you've been in this space for a long time. But the biggest question I get all the time and you alluded to this in the hydrogel as well a little bit is, you know, the disposable diaper. Can we get there? Oh, I, can we get there? I'm an, ever an optimist. Yeah, sure, we can get there. Do you want them to be cheap? Okay. Like, I mean, so, I mean a completely <laughs> biodegradable, disposable. Yeah. yeah, it has to be cheap. Yeah, that's the issue. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I made the comment in my presentation about that because I think that there are many interesting solutions that are, you know, for example, published. In fact, we published some work of my colleagues, Tom Hoy, on some hydrogel materials from a bio-based molecule that could in principle be degradable, you know, but it's the, the route is a little bit, you know, maybe not as streamlined as you like. So I'm going to answer your question with, yes, we can get there. Uh, moreover, I think we need to get there, um, especially for material, for things that are clearly not recyclable. 
and clearly you want them to ultimately bio, biodegrade. And so, you know, there has to be infrastructure for that, uh, Curtis, you know, so for example, I'm going to pick an easier one than diaper, if you don't mind, I'll pick compostable food packaging. Mm -hmm. So food packaging, um, you know, is oftentimes contaminated and it's not easy to recycle because of that. So in Minneapolis, we have infrastructure for composting. I have a composting bin at the end of my, uh, end of my uh, driveway. And so what you could imagine is with the food waste goes the plastic packaging waste. So that also has to be done cheaply and it needs to be uh, uh, compostable. Those solutions exist right now. You're asking about the next level on things that can easily be going to the compost, for example. Uh, but yes, I think that when you talk about degradability, you really have to differ. When you say biodegradable, you really have to ask the question, uh, how fast and under what conditions? Okay, so if it gets strewn in the environment accidentally, it can biodegrade under some, some polymers can, or in the oceans, for example, versus being in a well-controlled and engineered, uh, for example, compost. So in my opinion, the answer is yes, we can get there, but we need more basic fundamental research to understand how to do it in a streamlined, efficient, and economic way. Thank you, and, and one more for you uh, as well, and then, um, and then I'm gonna use that as a segue into, into Scott as well. And, and this is again is, is uh, an, an opinion question to some extent, but, and we get it a lot, it, it's, it's risen before, and it's, this is the whole fuel or biopolymers versus food debate, right? Can we, can we do both on the planet with, with, the, with the land base that we have, the, the moisture we have, et cetera? And I, I know you're not in, in the crop production space, but you must get that question or you've probably thought about it too. I do, I do get that question. When you start talking about the highest volume polymers um, like polyethylene and polypropylene, um, there can be, of course, challenges of just the amount of, of, of material available. Uh, but I have made a calculation before. This, this kind of common bio-based polymer called polylactide uh, comes from corn, and it's oftentimes used as a replacement for polystyrene. And the calculation back of the envelope, so please check this, uh, that I made was, uh, is that um, uh, if you were to replace all of the polystyrene in the U.S. with polylactide, like for a plastic cup, it's often, often used, um, that would require 1% of U.S. corn. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding, at least in the corn grower uh, arena, and we partner with the Minnesota Corn Growers actually on research initiatives, is that, you know, there are people are looking for outlets, industrial outlets for their corn crop. They, they, that's why they're funding us. They want more opportunities other than ethanol and you know, animal feed and things like that. And so, so my view is, is that in the fullness of time, we wanna make plastics out of grass and non-nutritive biomass, trees maybe, but, um, but from the, the lowest hanging fruit, uh, so to speak, is this, the starches and sugars that come from, and, and oils uh, that come from uh, common food crops. Um, so I think that will evolve over time, but I don't think if we started making plastics that uh, um, uh, you know, in some in, in a larger fashion than we do now from biomass, that we're going to in the short term jeopardize any food source. Thank you, uh, Scott. Um, yeah, I'll get maybe get some thoughts on on the food versus fuel a, a bit too. But um, just you know, from 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 the ground up, if there was a farmer in landmark Manitoba who wanted to <laughs> invest in venture capital. Can that happen? <laughs> or how um, do you do it? Yeah, I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm, I'm not sure of the, of the, uh, uh, the culture in Canada. I lived there in the summer and farm, and I'm not uh, totally aware of all the venture capital activity and, and tech investing on, in Canada at this time. As far as, um, you know, our company and many of the companies we work with, they are, there's a very few public companies that are ag tech venture capital firms um, that I know there, there may be some out there, but the ones that we're working with for the most part have a very dedicated specific uh, group of, of investors that are um, providing the money to the venture capital firms. As far as um, a farmer in landmark that's looking at opportunities, you know, I, I did mention uh, ag funder and it's kind of a, a great, clearinghouse of all the information that's going on with ag tech right now 
they also invest in ag tech. So uh, they, they often are, you know, uh, working on, on behalf of their own investments too. But um, as far as an individual getting involved, um, I'm, <laughs> I can't direct anyone to, to a specific location or group at this point. Um, but it, I'm sure it exists out there. Thank you. Uh, Jitao, in interest of time, how much, uh, how much time do we have yet? Do you know? I, I haven't been following my clock here, so. Oh, you're muted. Pardon me. Pardon me. I think we have another five minutes. Okay, perfect. Well, in that case, um, just to sort of bring the two of you together, uh, Scott and Mark. So I'll start with, with Scott then. In terms of you know your the investment space, um, thinking about what you've been hearing a little bit from Mark in, in the in the polymer, and I I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but what do you think about uh, you know it, the the investment opportunities um, in in some of the in in some of the bio based um, biopolymers bioplastics um, in that space for 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 innovation. Um, it's a space we've we've looked at a bit, um, and we're not, you know, we we, we aren't necessarily a representative of, of the industry. We are we're not uh, we're not out there advertising ourselves. We're pretty passive, and in, in companies coming to us, obviously we're a small team, and a lot of our our recent investments have been connection to other VCs that want us involved because we have a direct connection to farms and agriculture. So um, we we don't necessarily see all that's uh, got potential out there uh, and, uh, right off the bat. But as far as the biopolymers and that sort of thing, this is something that interests us for sure. Um, it is, it, it's a, it, it becomes a bit complicated as to, you know, is this going to be a public policy thing or is this going to be a market driven thing? And that's what we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're confident that this is this has got the economics behind it without policy driving whatever uh, opportunities there. And 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 Mark, you're right in the heart of 3M. You know, Minnesota Mater Mining and Materials. I believe that's what they were originally called. And uh, and so that's that's sort of where some of the some of the plastics really got their foundation. If I understand my history correctly, do you see the lar Like, is this something that that the large, uh, the large food manufacturers, uh, the large uh, consumer and uh, durable goods manufacturers, are they actively looking at this space or do they look at it and say, well, feedstock is gonna be a, a, a limiting factor. I'm thinking of, you know, again, we have lots of grass clippings we could probably use if you wanted to take your, move out of the egg space, et cetera. But, but do you see that the, the big multinationals really stepping into this space or is it, a long way away yet? Um, the answer is yes to both, I think. And let me try to explain that. There's no question that there's a sustainability link on every, every major chemical and plastics manufacturer website, front page. Mm -hmm. And they highlight the efforts they're using with bio-based feedstocks, with degradable materials, with chemically and physically recyclable materials. But Scott's point is a very good one, okay? It depends on largely right now economics we're talking about basically commoditized materials for packaging you know millions of metric tons you know tens of millions of metric tons every year um uh millions of metric tons every year being produced at very very low cost now what they are in my view and we have an industrial advisory board at the center for sustainable polymers who's telling this all the time is that my view is that they're preparing for both consumer driven we want this you know, we want to be able to buy a biodegradable cup when we go to, a, you know, a, a, the grocery store, number one. And number two, uh, when policy changes happen, they need to be prepared. OK, so they will be out of business in smaller markets like, you know, the like city of San Francisco and things like this that make, you know, they're kind of the leading edge of these kind of more bio and green based policies. But when that starts taking root at a much larger level. I think they want to be prepared, Scott, but you're right. It's kind of one of those things, you know, when, you know, so they've got some, there's no doubt that they're interested in it, but getting from a discovery in our center to the shelf of the grocery store is a long-term ordeal, Curtis. So I think the preparation is happening now. I'm going to argue 
that that really and this is you know self-serving in some way i fully recognize that but the basic research efforts to understand the fundamentals from which all new technologies have been sprung really um is what's so critically important and i think that's why these companies support us and i think that's why these companies partner with us because they're very good at technology translation and i think they want to be ready uh, when, you know, when Walmart says all your packaging needs to be bio-based, what are you going to do? You're going <laughs> to have to respond to that. And, and I think that Scott's right. It's not quite there yet, but they're preparing. Mm -hmm. Curtis, I, uh, I enjoy the discussion so much. I actually gave you the wrong time. I apologize. Uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, everybody enjoyed uh, thoroughly the discussions and the presentations as I did today. Um, uh, I, I would like to thank the speakers and, and uh, for the lively discussion, as well as the participation of our audience in, the, in, the, in this uh, session. I would like again, highly encourage everybody to join the network launch. And I also wanted to uh, mention that the sessions will be available on demand for one week. Uh, this concludes our session. I look forward to joining you in the next session this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks both.